But basically what I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, is looking at how uncertainty is communicated uh, in news reporting on climate change. And we've actually been doing a study on it uh, that we're trying to get ready for our publication in the next week. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uncertainty in general in the media, in climate news stories, and then I also want to tell you a little bit about the results from our analysis. So one of the tricky things about uncertainty is that when we say uncertainty, we are often thinking of different things. So as a science community, when we think about uncertainty and uncertainty related to climate change, maybe we're asking questions about how accurate are our models, what kind of assumptions are we making? Are we ignoring key feedbacks in the climate system? Do we have to assume that there are policy or technology changes being put into place that are completely outside our science sphere? Are we talking about error ranges, about specific numbers like temperature change or sea level rise? The difference is when the public often thinks about uncertainty, what they're actually thinking about is some of these words. And so this is from Roger's thesaurus online. And a couple of the key ones that I wanted to pull out include words like concern, anxiety is a big one, distrust, sort of this overtone of fear. Um, and then when you think about words that when people think of certainty, so an antonym, what they're thinking about is things like security. So certainty is a great thing, and uncertainty is something you worry a lot about. So even though we're using the same types of words, we can often be speaking very different languages. And one of the challenges that we face as scientists is that we're not often the ones communicating directly with the public. Most of the time, the media is acting as a middleman for us. And so we have to think about the way then that the media is going to translate our scientific uncertainty into the public sphere. There was a really interesting study done in 1995 here on the campus, here on, at the University of Colorado, uh, done by Wilson, um, which looked at where people get their news information. And she had actually looked at um, these received geography students, um, undergrads, and I think one of the kind of 101 type geography classes here. And I realize this is a little hard to read because I copied it right out of the study. But what she's showing is what students are reporting as their primary sources of information on science. And so while you might think, well, they've been in school, they're geography majors, maybe they're learning about science in class, previous geography classes and previous science classes account for only about 40% of their primary material on science information. Whereas if you could look at local television, national television, public TV, uh, newspapers and magazines and national news, that's accounting for much closer to half of where they're getting their information, or half the students are saying this is our primary source of science information. So not only is the media acting as a middleman, but they're really the major source of information on a lot of issues like climate change for the general public. And so thinking about the language we're using is really important, particularly with terms like uncertainty that are interpreted so differently between the public and science sphere. Now one of the other challenges we have to think about when we're talking to the media about science and climate change is that there are certain journalistic practices that influence how stories are picked and how stories are told. And one of the big ones is the hook in media. So journalists are always looking for a reason why to cover the story right now. What makes it a green story? And so a couple of the hooks, and this is actually from a website called the Op-Ed Project, which is to try to help citizens actually get their opinions into the news, they list a couple big hooks that are often used. And I pulled out four of them. One of them being that making things dramatic is often very newsworthy. Um, turning something that's conventional, sort of like, here's what we expect, oh, but it's not really the case. So turning it on its head is another good one. Pointing out contradictions. Scientists thought this, but oh, in fact, they're wrong. Um, or citing major news studies. And so to show a couple examples from the news that Maureen and I have been looking at from the, the past month or so, here is an example from the Wall Street Journal. This is in February of 2007, which is about the time that the AR4, the fourth assessment report of the um, International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was released. And so they, this is the first sentence, it's called the lead of their story. The title is, UN reports, so that's the IPCC, adds pressure to global warming fight. 
And then their lead is that a report being published today that more authoritatively and explicitly links human activity to global warming is expected to increase pressure on governments and companies to reduce fossil fuel emissions. Now the very same day, the New York Times ran the story this way. So they said, even before its release, because this is technically the day before, World Climate Report is criticized as too optimistic. It's too good to be true. So in its 2001 assessment, its third, the IPCC estimated that in the next 100 years, sea level would rise globally by as much as three feet. But in Paris today, the panel will moderate its gloom on sea levels, lowering its worst case estimate. So in this case, what they're doing is they're setting up sort of that contradiction for us by saying that, well, in fact, they thought it was going to be as much as three feet, but they were really wrong. It's going to be a few inches. This is nothing to really worry about. So they've set this up under this framework of a contradiction. And this idea of talking about frames is really common when you're looking at news analysis. And it's the idea that we're taking certain pieces of the story and really emphasizing them as the most important. Here's just another example, this one now from the Wall Street Dur Journal, which is also showing a contradiction frame. Latest report shows climate pessimists were climate realists. In other words, those deniers were more realistic than we've been finding them out to be. And in fact, maybe those of us saying sea level is going to be three feet have been blowing it way out of proportion. Another really common frame that you see in the media uh, and climate change is a controversial frame. And several studies have pointed this out. And I, I put up this picture, it's actually about uh, water on the Mississippi. But what I'm trying to show you is that it's, it's really common in media to pit talking heads against one, each, one another. And you see this a lot if you're watching the news on MSNBC or CNN or Fox News or, or really any of those um, cable channels. What you'll find is that it'll be a he said, she said kind of story. And so that's where a lot of the drama is created by having these talking heads pitted against one another. In, in the case of controversy, it's also tricky because there, t there tends to be this journalistic practice or this norm of objectivity, the fair and balanced sort of approach to news. And when journalists just don't have time to find out or investigate a particular story or a particular piece of the news, well, it's just a lot easier to put two people who say different things against each other and at least they're, they're recovering our bases and getting all aspects of the story covered, even if they may not be entirely right, or one may be more right than the other. Um, and so that's something that Max Boykoff, who's a fellow here at Sirius and a professor at the university, um, he studied a lot of the way that this um, norm of objectivity actually makes climate science reporting less accurate. So the problem with some of these frames is that what they do is they actually create a more confusing story for the public. Well, he said, she said. Well, they've contradicted each other. What am I to believe? Is it three feet? Is it a couple inches? How am I supposed to get the real information out of this news? And so one of the ways that journalists can actually help the public understand stories better is by giving them more context about contradictions that may appear or controversy, controversy that may develop. And so there was another study done uh, by Kerbett and Durfee. And I think Durfee is now actually at CSU, but this study was done, I think, when she was at Utah. Um, and so this was done in 2004. What they'd done here, very similar to the Wilson study, is they interviewed groups of students at the university. And what they did was very clever. They gave them a news article, which started with this lead. So a study published today in Science has found that parts of Antarctica, the frozen continent, are getting thicker rather than thinner. So maybe we were wrong about climate change. Most of the stories did not contain any real additional scientific info. That was the control group. Then they gave a group of students the same study, but they added a whole paragraph that explained why Antarctica is getting colder and thickening rather than um, showing the same kind of melting and warming that we're seeing in other parts of the world. And when the students rank these as more or less uncertain, the students that read the paper with context thought that it was a lot more, that there was a lot more certainty, a lot more scientific agreement about what was going on, while those who were given no additional context felt like it was pretty uncertain and that scientists had no clue what global warming was all about. 
So context can really help solve the problem of uncertainty. The problem is journalists usually leave it out. And so without having enough context, they can accidentally make the story more uncertain than it really is. So we've looked at examples of how news or language choices can really shape climate change stories and how framing or the addition or subtraction of context can also shape um, climate change stories. And there's been a lot of work done really looking at that second side of, um, of how framing in, um, in newspaper stories shapes public perception on climate certainty. But there's been a lot less work done on how newspapers, what kind of language choices they're actually using to talk about things that are uncertain related to climate change. And so that's the angle we decided to take in our study, is to look very specifically at the grammatical and word choices that news articles are using, the tone those grammatical and word choices convey, and then also the subject matter that they're talking about to find out how uncertainty is being translated from scientific to public spheres. And so what do I mean exactly by that? Well, I thought I'd bring up this example. This was from, this is um, out of the New York Times. And some of you might remember that the New York Times broke a story that a staffer in the White House during the Bush administration had taken a climate change report from US scientists and basically went in and edited with all these little word additions. So put in a conditional modal verb here, might, mm -hmm. instead of something will happen. Um, up here they added could. Let's see, down here they also said, well, in, you know, instead of saying that we're going to facilitate this scientific information, let's say that we're going to reduce a lot of significant remaining uh, uncertainties. And so by adding these little changes in language, they took this report that many scientists felt was actually quite certain about the science that they were trying to convey and made it a lot less certain to the administrative officials that ended up reading it. And so that was really big when it hit the news. I think it took several years to come out, which um, some of you may remember better than I, but I feel like the report was in 2002, 2003. And I think the story didn't actually hit until 05, it could have been 06. So we wanted to look at these kinds of language additions or changes in news that then shape the way uncertainty is communicated. And not just about climate change science itself, so not just about how much temperature is going to change or how much sea level is going to rise, but also about the notion of the IPCC as a committee, its process, its consensus, the agreement among scientists, the um, basically whether the IPCC is being showcased as a scientific body or as a more political body that's trying to manufacture some type of global warming hoax. So what we did is we decided to look at newspaper articles from 2001, 2007, from two different countries, the US and Spain. And in the US, we looked at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I'll mostly be showing you examples from those. To narrow down and pick our news articles, we wanted to make sure that they were talking specifically about the IPCC and its report. So we used a search engine called Factiva, which is great. If you've never used it, I had never used it until this particular project, you can get to it um, from Chinook, the Colorado Library. Just type in Factiva and it brings you right to it. And so you can put in all these really fantastic Boolean search terms. Um, you know, for example, looking for intergovernmental panel as a phrase, you can look at panel and climate in the same story, you can look at um, certain words that are within a certain distance of each other. So it's really helpful to be able to use that kind of um, a very specific search engine. And then we looked for the specific date ranges. Here I'm showing the 2001 articles, and then we also looked in 2007 in the four newspapers. And so the results end up looking something like this, um, where you just get a list of all the news that um, meets what you want, and then you can just export it. So in total, we got a lot more news articles than we were really able to handle, something like several hundred per paper, um, so on the order of 800 articles. And I think in the, in the end, this is what we ended up really analyzing. Um, so about 20, 25 articles from each paper, about 20, I guess, almost 50,000 words, or maybe a little more, 
60,000 or so words in total that we ended up analyzing. And what we did is we would go through the news articles and then we would mark each phrase or word that we felt conveyed some sort of uncertainty. So here you have a numeric range being presented, the word chance, which suggests that there's a possibility. Uh, here highlighting in blue, it's talking about a shift in language in the report, so that notion of contradiction. What, what is the eventual report going to say? Um, we have a lot of if clauses, which tell us, well, this will happen, but only depending on this contingency. Um, we have qualifying adverbs, like largely. In other words, the goal is to really understand the science. Well, we will largely get there, but not entirely. Um, things that are potential, things that are likely, um, verbs like project, project, predict, estimate, uh, and there are many more. And so one of the tricky things was actually making sure that we were interpreting the uncertainty similarly. Because not only did we have to make sure that we agreed that these are words that convey uncertainty, but we wanted to make sure we were looking at things that only talked about the physical science basis of climate change. And in a lot of these stories, even though they may focus on working group one of the IPCC, they often mention impacts or possible technological solutions that end up appearing in working groups two and working groups three. So we actually had to make sure we were agreeing also that the subject matter was relevant. So our first run, we had very low agreement. There's sort of a pooled variable test you can do called the Kirbendorf's alpha for intercoder reliability. You're supposed to hit 0.7 as your, as your cutoff, and we were down around 0.53. So Lorraine and I got together, went through our, I think we did 10,000 shared words that we were looking at, and came up with a master list for guidance. And went back, we analyzed everything, and came back with a Kirby South of 0.71. So from there we refined one more time, and went back through all 60,000 words to analyze them, and to place them into 10 grammatical categories, into I think seven categories for tone, and then into eight or nine categories for subject matter. We have an incredible spreadsheet with a lot of <laughs> columns. <laughs> but um, in the end, here are a couple of results. And really, I want to stress, um, I guess, I'm going to show you two result figures and then a few implications from them. So, um, so from our newspapers, uh, we had two from Spain, two from the US. And the shading here is actually showing the darkest is the USA in 2001, then it's USA in 2007, and the, light, the lighter colors are Spain for the two different years. And what you're seeing here is sort of a density or frequency. Um, in total, we ended up with about 1,170 what we call epistemic markers, which just mean those things that are conveying some sort of, sort of room for doubt. Um, and here are our 10 grammatical categories. Uh, some of these you'll recognize right away. Verbs, adverbs, adjectives, nouns, those numerical ranges, conjunctions like if, um, or, two, th two feet or three feet is a nice way to hedge the number when you don't know exactly what it is. We also looked at verb tense, which is particularly important in Spanish. And we looked at modal verbs like could, should, might, can, um, may. And this last funny one over here I won't really talk about, but it's constructions. It was those oddball things like the report fell short, or missed the mark, or um, you could pick holes in this. So those were verbal constructions where you really need both the verb and something else, like a preposition, to give you the final um, meaning of what it's talking about. And so the main thing to take away from this, uh, we had a couple hypotheses going in. One is that um, studies that have looked at framing suggest that cultural and ideological differences between papers uh, and between countries really tend to show up in the way that they frame their views on climate change. So Spain has been a leader on Kyoto. Um, lots of the stories from 2007 are like interviews between the president and Al Gore. They were really excited when he won um, the, uh, I guess, shared the Nobel Peace Prize. And, uh, and then, of course, the US has sort of dragged its feet on these international policies like Kyoto. Uh, and, and we've been a little less likely to come to the international negotiation table on climate change issues. So we were expecting that given those cultural differences between the two countries, we would see um, much more hedging in the US than in Spain. In other words, they would talk about uncertainty a lot more in their news articles on climate change. And so when you look at this figure, that's exactly what this is showing. But 
Across the years, the U.S. is consistently hedging more, except in a couple of really minor categories like, well, Spain just tends to more explicitly state what the ranges are. And they tend to state ranges that have both limits defined, so two feet or three feet, rather than in the U.S. you see a lot of cases where it's, well, it could be more than two feet, but they don't really give you a sense of what that end limit is. So in terms of the overall um, uncertainty, the U.S. is using a lot more of these epistemic markers to say we don't quite understand the science or we're unsure or speculating on what's going on, while Spain is doing a lot less of it, and when it is doing it, it's using much more direct translations of uncertainty from the science, like giving an actual numerical range. So just thinking again about the IPCC report and their hedging in terms of how the conveyance of uncertainty and likely, very likely, yep. unlikely, did you pull those out? Because that to me is a quotation. I mean, I recognize, you know, it, 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 you know, some of the ranges are quoted direct. I mean, were you, does that make a difference if you're including that? I mean, I can also understand. I also understand. You know, that represents a choice whether or not to report the range that's reported or the median right. in the in the document. But I'm curious what, what your perspective. We is. haven't pulled out the quotes yet. We've actually marked them all, and okay. we've marked the titles. Those are two things that we're really interested in. Is is it being quoted directly from the report from that's scientists, that's okay. um, or you know, in terms of the titles, it's actually actually an editorial choice as opposed to a journalist choice. Okay. So those. But, um, but in terms of just the overall results, we've actually counted everything. Okay. So in other words, when we get our news articles, um, whether it was a pullout quote that sort of showed up in a little box, um, whether it was repeated at the foot or underneath a figure caption, whoever said it, we ended up marking it because we figured at some point the public is seeing it. And yeah, we're not necessarily right. making the distinction about who's you know, actually the messenger here. Yeah. Um, we also included opinion pieces. Most news analyses will not include opinion pieces, but they turned out to be, um, at least for some of the papers, as much as 34% of the news on climate change is coming out of the opinion pages. And my understanding is that the opinion pages are some of the most read of any, news article, of any newspaper. And so while we made sure that these kinds of differences were not sensitive to the opinion pieces, what's very interesting is they're not. There's way more hedging in the news than there is in the opinion pieces. When the opinion pieces don't like climate change, they just say, wrong, end of story, move on. They don't sit there and go, could, maybe, possibly, perhaps. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the news tends to do a lot more hedging. I, I was wondering if, if you did a, a kind of a linguistic control where you did this analysis on a random selection of articles, just to um, remove any just different uses of those words in the language that are unrelated to the, the content of the story. Do you see what I mean? Do you mean just just um, like markers that are just uh, not related to the working group one science? Yeah, I'm just saying like the way like linguistic differences between Spanish and English where they might choose to use certain words more, but it's unrelated to the content. It's just simply right. a linguistic evolutionary difference. No, it might not be just no, how, is, how is the news written in general, regardless of the topic? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That was a. I think it was always something in the back of my head, but but probably a whole other study in some regards. No, we, we didn't. And sort of our control was basically to pick January one and run with it. Um, both news reports came out around February, uh, in both two thousand one and two thousand seven, the third and fourth assessment reports, and so. Um, we figured January 1 was as good as random a date as any because it gave us a little headway before the reports actually hit the stands and then it gave us some time to, to cover the follow-up. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think a follow-up that would be really fun is to take other science news, science news from like NASA or something that's just, you know, space or medicine or something not related to climate and look at whether it has the, the same density of, um, of epistemic markers. Because to some extent, you could argue that what makes climate change so uncertain is we are talking about the future. Like in many ways, it's much more like talking about stocks or something that we're trying to predict. And Run it against the financial page. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 yeah. But um, I think what was really helpful is in actually looking across the grammatical categories, for instance, the U.S. doesn't really use verb tense to express any type of uncertainty, whether Sp where Spanish does. 
And yet that was not a big difference between them. And so we also looked at the word choices for grammatical category to see if they were talking about climate change using the same word choices and the same tone. And there were a lot of similarities too. So this difference is actually mostly in sheer number. And that makes me think that it's much more related to the cultural differences than it is to linguistic choices for the two countries. So here's um, also, uh, we wanted to look at difference with time. Because you think about how the IPCC understanding of climate change um, progressed from 2001 to 2007, from the third assessment until the fourth assessment reports, there was a lot more shoring up of estimates. Um, there was a stronger link stated between human activities and global warming. Um, and there seemed to be more emphasis too on at least several outside studies came out saying there's a lot of scientific agreement about this uh, that were independent of the IPCC. And so given that, you would expect that the mentions of uncertainty or leaving room for doubt in the news stories should have gone down between 2001 and 2007. Yet across the board, that was not the case. Um, there were a couple newspapers, uh, one from each country, in which the number or the density of epistemic mark was basically stayed the same. And for the New York Times and one of our Spanish papers, El Mundo, which is the more conservative of the Spanish papers we picked, the hedging actually went up with time. And so that, that was particularly surprising for the New York Times, which has some really spot on reporters talking about climate change, people who get it, who definitely think it's an issue and, uh, and yet are doing a lot of hedging uh, when it comes to talking about climate news. And it was also, as you can see, it's pretty much across the board in terms of the grammatical categories, the increase from 2001 to 2007. I think you would have to, I think a little caution in the 2001 versus just with that statement about more hedging, just because thinking about the SPNs that came out of working group one in both those, those the 2001 report, the way that they characterize everything, the uncertainty language and the ranges are different than the way that they are in the 2007 report. Right. So that's where the quotations and what is pulled directly from the press release and stuff from the IPCC seems like that might change your results. I just, I just wonder about that. So that's why we actually looked at each individual grammatical category and started looking at the types of words chosen and the okay. tone. Okay. And actually the and biggest so the, okay. increases are not due to things like well, we used a lot more ranges. Yeah. So there were really big changes in verbs yeah. and really big changes in nouns. And these are some of the types of verbs you would see much more frequently in 2007. And it is the English I'm showing you, but you actually saw these as well in the Spanish newspapers. And you can see that a lot of them are talking about the fact that, well, 2001, they predicted this, but oops, they got it wrong. It's actually the observations don't match up with the predictions. And it's usually really small things, right? Like, you know, sure, they lowered the sea level estimate by a few inches or maybe a foot. But, but given sort of the range of uncertainty, scientifically, that doesn't seem like maybe a big deal to us. But when it's reported in the news, there's very little context around these changes. And so the readers are just saying, hmm, that prediction didn't turn out like expected. There was also a lot more talk about things being debated. Um, I love this one, backpedaling on issues. <laughs> Startling revisions was one that showed up in the nouns. Um, and a lot of talk about the models failing. So not just predictions being wrong, but the climate models failing. And so it's not that we're simply saying there's more likelihood of this, um, that they're quoting more ranges more often. They're actually shifting their focus to talk more about problems with the scientific agreement, and problems with the previous predictions, which aren't necessarily problems, it's a refining process. But in not providing any context, they're not helping the reader understand that. And so here's to show you some of those nouns that changed. Um, again, things like points of contention, that it's a political process. Um, one was, it's a peculiar group. Um, they're Cassandra-ish, it's all Alice through the looking glass, and it's some really strong statements. You know, this one, fatal flaw of global warming, pure guesswork, you know, these are things that are just sort of untrue. <laughs> they're, they're just not sound or robust um, descriptions of, of the process. And so when we think about why there's been an increase in hedging, um, we definitely have to consider the fact that we are stressing more disagreement, even though there's been more agreement, and that's happened in both the US and Spain, despite the fact that 
they have these cultural differences on climate change and we would expect Spain to talk way less about disagreement in the scientific community. Um, and that they're talking about the fact that they're comparing changes in predictions between years without really giving context. <coughs> and here are some examples of that. Um, this is from the New York Times. This one's great because it points it all out. It starts out, one major point of debate in early drafts of the report is the projection of a smaller rise in sea level, but who knows why. They've been relying on computer models and observations and struggling to find a consensus, basically, over what to say about them. Um, the Wall Street Journal, I think, does a better job in this particular example of giving some context for certain changes. For example, they use the idea that IPCC scientists keep refining, which is a less, the tone is much less strong than struggle to find consensus. Um, they're narrowing a range of predicted sea level rise instead of saying, oh, it's a smaller rise without any context. Um, and in some cases, sure, they're settling on a less dire best estimate. And then they give you even more information. The first report said three, then the next report said two, and now they're saying two to four. So in other words, they're giving us more of a range, they're giving us a lot more information. So that wasn't uniformly across the board. It's not as though the New York Times was consistently um, giving less, less contextualized information. This was just a particularly good example that I wanted to pull out where they were talking about similar subjects. So what are some of the take homes from this? Um, I, I wanted to share, I guess, three ideas. One is that science is always progressing. We're always learning new things. Um, when we're talking about it, and particularly talking about changes, there's this wonderful tendency in our culture to, to talk about changes as flip-flops. I mean, we've seen it a lot in politics, um, and it's really considered a negative thing in our society. And so I think providing context and making sure that if you're in a case where you're talking to the public or journalist, making sure that you clearly explain why there's a difference in the numbers that they might have seen earlier and the numbers they've seen now can help a lot. And, and that goes back to that uh, Kerbert and Durfee story or a study that I, that I showed you where they found that um, college students, when they were given context, felt that the scientists were much more sure. Also, if you don't want it to be conveyed as sort of a political debate, don't fall into the trap of calling it a climate change debate or a fight or a war. Um, it's a term that shows up again and again in both the English and Spanish news articles on climate science. And I think it's really tough because it then gives the sense that, well, it's something that if I argue strongly enough as a general citizen, I can tell you what's right or not about climate change rather than actually weighing the balance of evidence and making an informed decision um, based on what experts um, have been able to study and predict. And then lastly, going back to that notion of wording, <laughs> um, you know, do, just do be careful with wording. It's, when we talk, we're constantly hedging. I think instead of you know, just coming out and saying something, these are things we do all the time in our, in our general conversations. Um, pretty is a great one. You say, yeah, that's pretty clear. Or, I kind of get it. Or, you know, those are ways of hedging that we just normally include in our everyday conversation. But if you are on record with a journalist, and it's something like, you know, IPCC said it was unequivocal, don't be quoted saying it's pretty unequivocal. And that was from a scientist. <laughs> um, also, watch for words like uncertain and uncertainty because they do have those different meanings and different connotations in, in science and public spheres. I, I was actually really pleased to see the emphasis on the numeric ranges um, and even the probabilities, because I think those come out of things like, when you say there's a 66% 66 probability, it's like a weather forecast. People are used to those terms. And so, it's so it's very... Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It's supposed to snow today. Yeah. yeah. But if, I think those are, that are certainly more clear than just saying something is uncertain and leaving it at that. Um, and lastly, just sort of a funny example, also from a scientist, just, just watch what you're saying. <laughs> so the last thing I wanted to leave you with is, um, if you are more interested, um, I, I know in some last lunch conversations we've talked about um, wording that can be difficult in translation between science and the public um, spheres. And there was actually an article in EOS a little while ago, um, several years now, that gives a great list and explanation of key words and phrases that are just really difficult for the public to get. So the way to find it is just 
type in this into Google, and it's like the second thing that comes up um, when you do it. I can show you. So it's this from Climate Communication. Oh, you can see it. I'm sorry. I can. Uh, oops. So if you go back to the search engine, if you type in "yes, yeah, science worth communication," it's the second PDF that shows up. And so improving how we communicate about climate scientists, so that was really useful. Um, and EOS is an AGU journal for those who may not be uh, members of the American Geophysical Union. But they occasionally have some nice articles on communication and education. So thanks, guys. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to share. And if, if you have questions or you just want